Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in today. My name is Kate Tarrant and I work for the Lower Blackwood Landcare Group based in the southwest of Western Australia. For those of you that don't know us, we are a not-for-profit independent landcare organisation with an interest in sustainable agriculture and the broader environment and river health in the Lower Blackwood catchment. You can find out more about us and the work we do on our website at lowerblackwood.com.au. Today's webinar is supported by SoilWise. SoilWise is funded by the National Landcare Programme Smart Farms Small Grants, an Australian government initiative. It's also supported by Healthy Estuaries WA, a state government programme. Uh, before we kick off, I would like to acknowledge that our Lower Blackwood catchment and the work we do falls within Wadandi and Pumin Budja, within which our streams and tributaries flow to join the Great Gorbilup, the, the Blackwood River. We recognise and respect that the Wadandi and Pumin ancestors and their descendants are the traditional custodians of this country and have a, a long and continuing connection to this land. Uh, just a few words on how today's webinar will run. You may have noticed that you can hear us but not speak yourself, and that's deliberate, so that we can keep things moving along at a good pace. You can definitely still ask questions though. Um, just type your question at any time into the chat box and I'll make sure it gets asked at the end of the presentation. Also, if you do run into technical difficulties, please uh, use the status button at the right, on the bottom right hand of the screen to let me know, and I'll see if I can fix it from our end. Uh, don't worry though, if you do drop out or have to leave early, we, will, we are recording this session and uh, I will be emailing it out to you next week. All right, so the reason you've all tuned in today, I'm delighted to have talking to us today, uh, agroecologist Joel Williams from Integrated Soils. Joel's particular interest is in designing farming systems that focus on managing soil biology along with crop and soil nutrition to, opt to optimise plant immunity and soil function. He has extensive practical experience in Australia, UK and Canada, where he's currently, currently based. Um, and it's very late at night there, so thanks, Joel. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he's also interested in integrating soil and plant analysis as, and analysis to, as a joined up strategy for managing production. Joel has a passion for teaching and sharing both scientific and practical knowledge on agroecological agro growing practices, that's a mouthful, and has lectured to farming aud audiences internationally. So without further ado, Joel, I'd like to welcome you to share with us your very extensive knowledge on nitrogen and how best to optimise its use in agriculture generally and more specifically in grazing systems. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much, Kate. And uh, thank you very much for having me and organising this. And, and uh, great to, to be here and speaking to uh, a WA audience. And um, yeah, I mean, the time zone is very easy where I'm based, actually. I'm exactly... 12 hours behind you. So it's uh, 8 p.m. here, which is not too bad. Um, I've done crazier webinars at crazier hours of the night. So um, this is quite respectable for me. But um, yeah, looking forward to it and the discussion coming up after. So I'll give a presentation first and then we'll, um, we can open the floor for some question and discussion. So let's dive into it. Um, we're kind of going to paint a big picture here really about nitrogen and then we'll drill down into some of the specifics as we go along and um and then i think we'll through the discussion we'll try and um narrow down in in some of the areas that you'd like to discuss as well so in terms of just to start the nitrogen cycle um, i don't want to dwell too much on this you've all kind of um, seen images like this and, and come across this idea before that of course nitrogen moves through many, uh, not only various different forms, but also um, moves around different um, parts and uh, all around the world um, and places in which we find nitrogen and, and kind of bringing it to um, a bit more related to from an agricultural context. You know, the main input of nitrogen, of course, is from fertilizer and um, typically, and of course, from our animals and, and um, agricultural inputs, so manures, et cetera, as well. And that nitrogen, of course, then enters the soil. And from there is, under ideal circumstances, we apply that nitrogen to the soil and it is taken up by the plant. And of course, then ultimately that is removed through harvest or through grazing, um, of course. So that's our kind of ideal, perfect little cycle where we apply it, we hold it in the soil, we take it up by the plants and then we export it back off. But of course, in reality, the soil is not 
so bulletproof. Um, it is nitrogen can be lost from the soil through various different um, ways and means. And part of that nitrogen um, that enters the soil, some of it does become soil organic matter and bound and wrapped up within soil organic matter where it is then stored and held. And that's, um, of course, a very favorable um, and positive impact on soil function. Some of that nitrogen is also held uh, on the soil particles, mainly the ammonium form here, of course, is held to the negatively charged soil colloid. So we have some uh, soil storage with, our, with that nitrogen, but we also have some losses. And of course, the um, three big ones of concern here is one, that nitrogen can leach or wash through the soil. So that's in the nitrate form. It'll um, flush down with water and leach down through the soil profile and then also that nitrogen can off gas and some of that off gassing will happen um, as uh, ammonia gas that's called volatilization um, but also some of the nitrogen can also off gas this is called um, denitrification where um, particularly the nitrate form will move back into those nitrous oxides so these are the leaky, um, this is why nitrogen is particularly a problem. It's become a nutrient that we're so dependent on to for production, but um, it's also very leaky and it can be lost um, through leaching or off-gassing. So that's those three main kind of exit points there, just summarizing those ammonia gas, nitrous oxides, and then leaching. So these are the big three that we particularly need to be mindful of and that we, through our management, we need to try and limit and contain these leaky fractions of nitrogen, um, keeping nitrogen in those in the more stable forms, which we will um, talk about as we as we go through. So this is um, unfortunately um, a global problem and nitrogen is being enriched in the environment, in the ecosystem, and there are concerns for um, so, soil quality, but also as that nitrogen moves into waterways, particularly um, concerns around um, nitrogen enrichment in waterways uh, and the oceans and dead zones and these kinds of things that, uh, that you've all, I'm sure, heard about. And what you're looking at here is a map of the excess application of nitrogen in relation to the productivity. So you can see that there are many, there's a couple of real, real hotspots here where we are over applying nitrogen into, in relation to the output and particularly parts of Asia is um, particularly concerning, Western Europe and also um, uh, over in North America as well. So, but nonetheless, you can see that it is um, a bit of a global problem. There are, um, there is nitrogen enrichment of the ecosystem happening um, all over the world, be that on land um, and in water. And what is the problem with that? Well, um, from a plant point of view, and this is true of our native plants, wild plants, uh, but also true of our agricultural plants, uh, that an excess of nitrogen in the plant creates an imbalance. And when we have an, ex an imbalanced plant or an excess of any nutrients, this in various ways and means can undermine plant health. And so again, this is true in um, a natural or agricultural context. If the plant has too much nitrogen and not enough of the other nutrients that work with that nitrogen, um, that nitrogen can build up um, and, and undermine plant health. Now, in, in, an, in a native, in a kind of um, natural context, in, in a native context, um, excess nitrogen then, because of that undermining of plant health, can actually lead to a loss of biodiversity. So we start to, if plants are, um, have more frail, fragile um, immune system, for example, they're going to be more prone to pest or disease. So over time, in a natural ecosystem, we can see loss of biodiversity. And I'm going to share a, a good example of this in a second. Um, soil carbon fluxes. So yes, I'll talk about this briefly, but yes, nitrogen is also a part of soil organic matter and important to build soil organic matter, but it can also undermine our ability to build soil organic matter as well. Um, as you're all aware, ammonia, um, that off-gassing, as well as particularly the nitrous oxides, these are um, greenhouse gases of particular concern um, in this day and age. And then the waterways, as I mentioned, as nitrogen enriches the waterways, this is depletes the oxygen. This can lead to things like algal blooms and acidification of the water bodies. So this is undermining aquatic ecosystems, for example. Um, and then even from a human health or livestock point of health point of view, um, specifically excess nitrates in the water, drinking waters, 
um, is also not good for us or for animals because again it will absorb and bind to oxygen and therefore reduce um, make our bodies anaerobic or in a lower oxygen state at least um, which is also not good for our health and then bringing it back from a to a agricultural context this is also not good for us with our efficiency and productivity um, goals in within agriculture and one of the big reasons for that is that excess nitrogen in the soil also um, suppresses nitrogen fixation and of course you all know this already with legumes if we apply nitrogen to legumes they um, will not form good and functional nodules and this is true of our cropping legumes but also our pasture-based um, legumes as well as nitrogen accumulates in the soil for example we are reducing the potential of that fixation here you're looking at the available nitrogen to phosphorus ratio again as that increases the nitrogenase activity that's the enzyme that um, the bacteria use to fix that nitrogen this also declines so yes as you all know nitrogen excess nitrogen in the soil has a suppressive effect on nitrogen fixation that's really important for your efficiency because nitrogen fixation that nitrogen in the air that we can fix through um, back those bacteria that's free nitrogen it is in your economic interest to optimize nitrogen fixation um, because it's free nitrogen and we all know the what happened recently with the price of nitrogen fertilizer um, and i'm sure that will cycle around again in in, in good time so just a few quick examples of this, uh, looking at the suppressive effects of nitrogen fixation. Um, it is also to add that it is not just legumes that fix nitrogen. Uh, well, the bacteria that associate with legumes, of course, uh, that um, fix nitrogen. We also have other bacteria in the soil who associate with grasses or broadleaves or other plants, uh, trees, shrubs, every plant that are um, that can also fix nitrogen so other bacteria that associate with other plants um, can also fix nitrogen now yes legumes and uh, the rhizobium of course they are the powerhouse of this they are the king of this but um, but others can also play a role um, as well and so here we have uh, a great study here looking at how nitrogen does suppress this i'll just quote you the highlight here um, here we're using a 35 year fertilization experiment and investigated the changes in nitrogen fixation rates and the diazotrophic community. These are the special bacteria that can fix that atmospheric nitrogen and, um, and the effects of uh, long-term fertilization um, on those bacteria. It was found that nitrogen fixation was drastically reduced by around about 50% after that 35 odd years um, of fertilization. So our work suggests that long-term fertilization might have selected against nitrogen fixation and against uh, those specific groups of end fixes. So had a suppressive effect on the functionality and activity of those organisms. And here we have another study um, also from a grassland. This is in UK from Rothamsted actually. And here we're looking at plant species diversity in a pasture. And so you can see where we have control, where we have no nitrogen fertilization. We have a much greater plant species diversity in that pasture. But as soon as we add uh, fertilizer treatments, of course, it is particularly the grasses that then begin to dominate. They are um, very nitrogen responsive. And so they begin to smother out some of the other plant species. So this is the point that I made earlier about how nitrogen can contribute to a loss of biodiversity. Um, here's an example also within a, a, a pasture agricultural context as well. So what about soil organic matter? Um, concerns around nitrogen um, and its potential to either build or burn soil organic matter and which one is it and there's a lot of debate and discussion on this and it's a bit of a nuanced um, topic we're not going to have time to go into it um, in full but i'm just going to hit the summary high level point here um, it's both it can indeed do both uh, there's a real mixture of studies that show this that it can go either way there's a kind of a lot of variables and nuance to this discussion but um, yes it can increase soil organic matter uh, through greater residue input into the soil. So by, of course, stimulating plant growth and biomass production, and therefore that litter and residue 
that is integrated into the soil can then help to build soil organic matter, but it can also decrease soil organic matter through increased mineralization or carbon mining. So when the nitrogen is enriched in the soil, the microbes will begin to eat that, absorb that nitrogen, and they're also looking for carbon to keep their bodies balanced as they grow and, and perform their functions. So they will begin to feed on soil organic matter to unlock carbon or mine that carbon to keep their carbon to nitrogen ratio in balance within their bodies. So, so yes, it can also decrease soil organic matter through this process. And even some studies say no effect. So it's a real mixture of both. And it does indeed um, depend on the context. And I've got kind of two just very quick examples to kind of just kind of hit maybe close to the bullseye on this. But again, I have to emphasize it's a nuanced discussion. But um, here's a really good one. This is a review. So it's a paper that's just reviewing lots of other studies and kind of drawing all of them, pulling them all together and kind of looking through for the overall trends and patterns and, and findings. And um, so here they suggest that nitrogen decreases um, microbial biomass, so soil biology, and of course that's key to helping to, to drive the formation of soil organic matter um, in grasslands, but not so much so in annual crops. So here's this point about it depends. Uh, we studied the effects of nitrogen and the nitrogen decreased the soil microbial biomass by 12% in grassland. The negative effect in grassland is likely due to that reduction in plant species richness or plant species diversity that we just saw an example of earlier. However, in annual cropping systems, that nitrogen input actually increased microbial biomass, therefore can increase the potential to build soil organic matter um, because the soil microbes ultimately benefited from the higher residue inputs when annual crops were fertilized. So, of course, with a pasture, it's already a perennial. You have permanent cover. Um, I know it might go a bit dormant in the summertime, but um, outside of that, you've got permanent cover. It's a perennial. It's allocating more carbon below ground to the roots. You get much more, of course, as you all know, potential to build soil organic matter in a perennial versus an annual phase. And in that, therefore, the nitrogen seemed to be more disruptive to that perennial system. But okay, in an annual system where it's um, not per permanent, it's not perennial, we don't see so much permanent cover, um, it's more sporadic in that growing season, sure, that bit of an extra spike in biomass production can help to integrate more litter and therefore build soil organic matter. So I, I just share an example where it's nuance and this, this nice summary highlights that nuance is depending on if it's grassland or, um, or cropping. And this um, study here, however, this is a recent-ish one from 2021 out of the U.S. This is on maize, but I think it, it taps into a really important point here um, about why nitrogen is so variable in terms of its uh, responses on, on soil organic matter. Um, and the key reason here is, is that when we talk about building soil organic matter and strategies to do this, um, the key take-home here is, is that in order to build soil organic matter, it's all about below ground carbon. It's about roots, root biomass, and it is about those root hexidates. The above ground biomass, the, the shoots, for example, they make a very minor contribution, a very small, very minor contribution. The main driver of building soil organic matter is root biomass, root litter, and those root hexidates. It's below ground carbon. And so what this um, study kind of really nicely showed is this again sorry i'm using that word all the time here nuance um, this insufficient and excessive nitrogen fertilizer input reducing maize root mass across soil types so again we're seeing kind of both two sides here so root mass was maximized near the agron uh, agronomic optimum nitrogen rate um, and um, the nitrogen fertilizer affected the root traits mainly in the uh, top uh, 30 centimeters here so texture also played a role. And I really want to just drag your eye over to the um, image on the right-hand side here, because this, this image here kind of captures the essence of this discussion. This was across um, here two different years. One year was a bit of a dry year. One year was a wetter year. But I really just want to drag your eye to this point. Now, let's start with yield. You're all aware that as you increase your natural fertilizer applications, that you will see an increase in yield up into that point of the plateau. And you can see this kind of plateau rounding off about here. 
Uh, in this particular year, we have a nice increase in yield um, as we increase nitrogen up into the plateau there. Now, that's yield, of course. You're all aware of this. But what about root biomass? And here, if we look at the red line, you can see that the root biomass, and this is in maize, as I mentioned, as we increase nitrogen, that the root biomass also increases up into a point. But then as we increase nitrogen, it does not plateau like yield does. We actually begin to see suppressive effects on the root biomass production. And it's again, same here in the dry year, but maybe not so pronounced. But after the um, optimum here, the root biomass is suppressed. So this is the key point here is, is that, as I've just mentioned, building soil organic matter is all about root biomass and root and those root exudates and nitrogen fertilizer at lower early on doses yes can increase that root biomass production but at higher doses will actually be suppressive and this is also then one of the key mechanisms by which nitrogen can suppress or reduce soil organic matter because it is suppressing root biomass production and that of course is the key feedstock to ultimately be broken down and decomposed and cycled and form that soil organic matter. So this kind of just helps to paint that picture of um, why nitrogen is so nuanced and why it um, can go either way, depending on the context. So let's move on now to a little more specifics. There's the kind of overview of nitrogen. Let's drill down a little, little bit into some more um, agronomically relevant discussion. So first thing to hear to say is that when we talk about the forms of nitrogen that plants can use, the key take home message here is that we must graduate our thinking beyond this simple idea that plants use ammonium and nitrate. Um, yes, they do use those two forms, but they can also use other forms. Plants can also use urea. Uh, when we apply urea, can't, plants can take it up as urea. However, when we apply urea to the soil, it has a tendency not to remain as urea. It will convert over to ammonium and then nitrate. So urea is not so stable. It doesn't stay as urea, but nonetheless, yes, some urea is in the soil. And yes, the plants can also take up urea, but plants can also take up organic forms. So things like amino acids, peptides, that's little chains of amino acids or proteins, even larger chains of these amino acids. So yes, plants can take up larger, more complex organic molecules, not just these simple ions like most um, chemistry and uh, most plant nutrition texts will tell you, but they can also take up these organic forms and it can even engulf whole bacteria. So even my whole microorganisms can even be a source of nitrogen. And I'm sure some of you have come across this before the discussion about the rhizophagy or rhizophagy cycle, where plants will actually engulf entire bacteria in their root tips and actually digest those and break them down um, and extract nutrients from them and spit them back out. So there are these other forms of nitrogen. And if we want to talk about nitrogen use efficiency, it's not just therefore about, well, how much did I apply and how much did the crop take up and how much did I harvest? Um, I would also argue that an efficient plant is a plant that can make use of all of these forms um, and be responsive and adaptive depending on these various fluxes in the soil. So key message, it's much more than those inorganic forms. It's also these organic forms. And we're gonna expand on this as um, more as we go. Um, just then here to say that, let's start with the inorganic forms, nitrate and ammonium. Um, when the plants take these up, they also have very different effects on plant growth. So nitrate is primarily metabolized in the leaf or utilized, converted in the leaf. And therefore it generally encourages more above ground biomass, shoot biomass. Whereas ammonium and, and those organic forms that I mentioned, they are metabolized and, and made, made more use of in the roots and therefore encourage more root biomass. So this is why um, plants with uh, high nitrates, they typically establish quicker um, than ammonium dominant systems who are slower to establish. But that's because these plants over on this side are growing, investing in roots first. And because they end up growing a bigger root system, this gives them a greater resilience to then catch up later in the season. And that's typically um, what we see is what happens. Now, beyond these physiological effects, um, underneath this, the plant 
um, has to make use of that ammonium or nitrate in different pathways. So it doesn't want ammonium or nitrate. Ultimately, it wants protein. It wants to build amino acids and then those proteins. And these two forms of nitrogen, they're just building blocks. They are fractions of nitrogen that the plant can use, um, but that ultimately will be converted onwards to protein. And you can see here um, that when ammonium comes into the plant, it's a one-step process to convert that ammonium into glutamine. Glutamine is the very first amino acid that um, this is the transition from inorganic to organic nitrogen. So we have glutamine and it's a one-step process. Now, when nitrate is absorbed by the plant, the plant has to actually convert that nitrate first to something called nitrite. So reduce that to nitrite. And then it has to reduce that further to ammonium. And then it will convert that ammonium into, again, glutamine, that amino acid. So from an efficiency or energy expenditure point of view, you can see here very clearly that ammonium is more efficient because it is a shorter pathway and therefore it uses less energy to get the job done. Whereas nitrate is a longer pathway, so it drains more energy in ultimately to build that um, amino acid glutamine. Now, then stepping on, if we then move on to talk about those organic forms, well, actually, they are even more efficient again. And I share this slide just to illustrate what I mentioned to you earlier, that yes, it's much more than just those inorganic forms. Um, but yes, we have a very high, big understanding of them and their role in plant nutrition. But as we move to these organic forms, like the aminos, proteins, and even less so those bacteria, um, as we move to these more complex organic and biological type forms, um, which these molecules become more complex, and our understanding of them um, in the role of plant nutrition de declines or diminishes. So we really know much less about this. It's an emerging field. Um, the traditional view has, has kind of been dominated here, but we are beginning to kind of unpack this, that sure, these other fractions and forms um, can also be um, um, very important and make an important contribution to plant nutrition. And there's been a really a good select, a good handful of studies and papers and reviews that have kind of really started to unearth this and explore this. I want to share you um, a quick quote here from one of them. This was a, a great paper out of uh, here in Canada, actually, in Saskatchewan, um, talking about these organic fractions of nitrogen and, and overlooked but potentially significant um, source of nitrogen for crop nutrition. So if I can just read you this quickly, uh, for more than a century, crop nutrition, crop nitrogen nutrition research has primarily focused on inorganic forms, uh, building the traditional model that agricultural plants predominantly take up nitrogen in that nitrate and ammonium form. However, results reported in the ecological and agricultural literature suggest that this traditional model of plant nitrogen nutrition is oversimplified. We propose several mechanisms by which organic nitrogen uptake and assimilation may increase nitrogen use efficiency, um, such as reducing the nitrogen assimilation costs. That's what I was just talking about, the efficiency or the energy efficiency there. We're going to expand on this now. Um, that these organic fractions, that they also promote more root biomass. So bigger root biomass means more nitrogen capture from the soil. Um, that these different forms and uh, organic forms also help to shape the microbial community. So um, encourage different groups of microbes to thrive and flourish. Um, and that also help the plants to recapture um, nitrogen-based root exudates, so kind of better nitrogen cycling, and ultimately aligning um, the root uptake to the soil nitrogen supply. So it's better synchronization of um, soil supply with plant demand. And just uh, an image to kind of summarize this, here's our traditional model that soil organic matter needs to be fully broken down or mineralized, released to release the inorganic fraction, which is then taken up by plants. But the current model says, okay, soil organic matter, as it is breaking down into from larger complex um, soil proteins and soil nitrogen molecules into smaller ones, such as those amino acids, for example, that yes, these organic fractions can be taken up then they can be some of those can be further broken down to inorganic fractions also yes but a step back here um, the plant can access these organic fractions like amino acids for example and this is really just repeating the same point here um, just with a different visual cue here we have kind of protein this is in the soil so this is thinking about soil um, decomposition or mineralization so soil organic proteins so soil nitrogen here embedded within the soil organic matter 
it, it, it typically the view is, the traditional view is this is too complex, plants can't take this up. It needs to break down first to smaller components. It needs to break down to smaller components. And only at the end point when it is mineralized and released as the inorganic ionic form, that then the plant will take up of that ammonium. Of course, some of that ammonium may be converted to nitrates and then be taken up um, or be taken up directly as ammonium. So this was the view that we have to wait for mineralization in order to make nitrogen available where it can then be taken up. And what does the plant do when it takes up ammonium? What does it then do with that once it's inside the plant? Well, it converts that ammonium back into organic forms, back into amino acids, back into those peptides, back into proteins in the plant. So we are completely reversing the process to break it down to only then rebuild it. And so the question here is, is that, you know, each step here along the way involves an energy drain, an energy demand on the plant to kind of um, fulfill this function. So the question here is, is, well, what if we just delivered to the plant these organic forms of nitrogen who are already up in this higher pathway than what which is what the plant wants and so this is called metabolic shortcutting we are shortcutting this metabolic pathway we just deliver these organic forms directly to the plant and the benefit of this is that we save the plant's energy so there's an efficiency gain because we are saving the plant's energy at each step here this is a drain a drag down a drawdown on metabolic energy so we bypass all of this and deliver nitrogen in these more efficient forms that ultimately shortcut the metabolic pathway. And so this is the point that organic forms are um, then more efficient because they save plants energy. And here's a really great paper that was also summarizing the point to this or the, and maybe the mechanism underlying this. Um, so I'll quickly read this to you. The chemical form of nitrogen taken up whether the inorganic versus or, such as nitrate or the organic form such as amino acids may significantly influence plant shoot and root growth and therefore nitrogen use efficiencies. The key point here is that the carbon cost or the energetic cost of assimilating those organic forms into proteins is less or lower than that of those inorganic forms which are further down the metabolic pathway mainly because the organic forms have carbon embedded in them already because they are organic, because they are nitrogen and carbon. Inorganic forms of nitrogen are inorganic because they have no carbon. That's why they're inorganic. Organic forms are nitrogen with carbon. And it is that carbon that comes attached to the nitrogen that gives it this efficiency gain. The carbon bonus makes it more beneficial for plants to take up, therefore, organic versus inorganic forms of nitrogen. And I'll explain this exactly why this is. Here we're going to do some carbon economics. This kind of table will summarize it really nicely. So what we're looking at here is the energetic cost to the plant or the carbon cost, the metabolic cost of making use of the different forms of nitrogen. So you can see here, let's start with comparing nitrate and ammonium. As I mentioned already, nitrate has a longer pathway versus ammonium. So it creates this greater drain or drawdown. And it's exactly what you can see here. So for the plant to convert nitrate ultimately into amino acids, you can see that the carbon cost or the energetic cost to do that is 5.81. Whereas ammonium, the carbon cost to convert or make use of ammonium is 4.3. So both of those are inorganic. They have no carbon bonus or embedded carbon. Therefore, the net carbon costs remain the same. So you can see that there is a greater carbon cost for the plant to make use of nitrate versus ammonia. Now, if we then compare that to the organic forms, and here we're comparing two amino acids, glutamine and arginine, you can see that there's still a carbon cost to kind of um, uptake these to get them to take them up through the roots, to translocate them to where they're needed. So there's still a carbon cost associated with the access and utilization of these forms. However, these forms have carbon embedded, a carbon bonus, as they call it here. So this cost is um, this carbon, but it's like a rebate. So of course it comes off the cost. And therefore, when we look at the net costs, we can subtract that, subtract that from the gross cost, giving us um, a lower overall carbon cost to make use of organic forms versus inorganic. So these are the most efficient. Because also, just to think about this, 
when I say carbon cost, where's the carbon coming from? When I say carbon cost, I'm talking about photosynthetic costs. The plant is photosynthesizing, breathing in carbon dioxide, uh, fixing that carbon into plant biomass, into sugars, etc., through photosynthesis. That's the carbon cost. So we are drawing down the photosynthetic potential of the plant. We are taking away photosynthetic carbon and, and making it, using it to um, metabolize those inorganic forms of nitrogen. So if we just supply the organic forms with embedded carbon, we are saving photosynthetic carbon. And that photosynthetic carbon can be used elsewhere on more tillering, on deeper root production, more biomass production, on whatever. And that's the efficiency gain is because we are saving the plant's energy. Now, this is then also why urea is an interesting source of, carb uh, of nitrogen because, surprise, surprise, it is actually an organic form of nitrogen. We talk about it as a context of an artificial fertilizer, a synthetic fertilizer, which it is, but it is, from a chemistry point of view, it is an organic molecule. It has carbon embedded. So urea, if we can get urea into the plant as urea, has an efficiency bonus because of that embedded carbon. The problem with urea is we apply it to the soil. And when we apply it to the soil, it doesn't stay as urea. It is converted over to ammonium and then over to nitrates, which those then inorganic forms, the least efficient forms, then are the ones taken up by the plant. So urea has a lot of potential here because it is carbon based, but maybe we just need to rethink how we apply it. And there's a clue for the next part of the lecture coming up in a minute. Okay, so just to summarize this, um, Here's the, therefore the metabolic pathway of nitrogen or how we convert, how the plant converts nitrogen. It can take up nitrates, yes. It can take up urea, yes. It can take up urea, uh, ammonium, yes. Um, it can take up amino acids. It can take up proteins. But all of those, no matter which form, ultimately they're all going to um, plug in or there are various exit entry points into this metabolic pathway where they're all moving towards these um, proteins, towards organic molecules. This is really the name of the game. The plant doesn't want nitrates. It doesn't really want urea. It doesn't want ammonium. It wants amino acids and particularly proteins. Um, this is really what it wants. And so this is the direction in which nutrients are typically going to flow. And what I've just done on this slide is just in the red boxes, you can see I've added certain nutrients. And these are the nutrients that are the catalysts for converting these per each step along this chain. So if we want to convert nitrate first into ammonium, we need molybdenum, sulfur, and iron. And if we have a deficiency of any, any one of these three, that nitrate will be stuck as nitrate. You won't be able to move along that pathway to form ammonium. Same with urea, uh, we need nickel. Nickel uh, is an essential nutrient for plant growth and its role is to help convert urea also into um, ammonium. Uh, once we have ammonium, then we need manganese and magnesium to build that into that glutamine, that amino acid we talked about earlier. And then once we are there, we can turn that to glutamine and, and move it around through all sorts of different forms of other amino acids and stitch them together to build the final, more complete and complex proteins. And we need a range of different nutrients for this, particularly the top three, phosphorus, sulfur, and magnesium, um, but also manganese, boron, um, potassium and zinc also play a role in this final step of protein synthesis. Okay, so that's your metabolic pathway. I include this just to emphasize the point that nitrogen is not an island. It does not operate by itself. You also need to consider these other nutrients in the boxes in order to optimize that nitrogen efficient use, utilization, and therefore nitrogen use efficiency. Now, I'm not saying that you have to apply these nutrients in the boxes but you do have to be aware of them or be managing them, checking for them. If they're there, then they're there. There is enough there. You don't need to apply more. If you have a deficiency, then you may need to apply more. Okay, and here's a quick example exactly of this. I just want to demonstrate here. This is a SAP analysis, and I just want to point out um, a couple of things here. Nitrate, so just jumping back, nitrate, you can see moly, sulfur, and iron were really important to shuttle that along this pathway. So let's have a look at nitrates here. Well, it's very high in this SAP analysis. You can see we have very high nitrates. So what are those nutrients that are responsible for the conversion of nitrates? Sulfur, iron, and molybdenum. So you can see here, sulfur also is low. Uh, iron is 
also low, molybdenum is also low. So the three nutrients that we need to convert nitrate onwards down that pathway are low, and surprise, surprise, nitrates are high. So we have a bottleneck. Nitrate is stuck as nitrate. We have a bottleneck here, um, unable to kind of sh uh, shift that along down that pathway um, onwards. I include boron here because boron is also low, as you can see, and boron, although not directly involved in the um, metabolism of nitrate, it does influence the activity of the nitrate reductase enzyme, the special enzyme that catalyzes that process. So low boron has been correlated with low activity of that special enzyme that is um, catalyzing, um, fulfilling that function. So here we have the recipe, perfect recipe for high nitrate imbalanced plants. This is going to undermine plant health. Um, if we address these uh, four deficiencies, uh, for example, through a foliar spray, um, we would then have the right ingredients to push that nitrate along um, and convert it into the proteins, into the organic forms. And for all of you graziers, of course, you know that nitrates are also not good in the pasture. This is not good for the animals. Um, we want good protein for the animals. And this is um, a nice example of this. Okay, so let's get a little practical then. What are our strategies that we can then use to manage nitrogen? And like all things in life, integrated strategies are the best. There's no one answer here. There's no best magic silver bullet. It's going to be many tools in the toolbox, many strategies that we use to manage nitrogen. And that's going to give you the best chance of success. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Let's integrate many tools, many strategies to manage this very important nutrient to make sure that one, we apply the right amount, that we keep it in the soil, that we're preventing losses, um, and that we're balancing that with all of the other nutrients. So just for example, I'm not going to go through all of these in the presentation. I'm just going to cherry pick a couple from this list, but I'm just sharing it as an example to point out that um, you want to use many strategies here, all as many of these as possible, all integrated into an overall program. So um, one, foliar nitrogen. I'm going to say a few quick words um, on this. Um, the other one is carbon stabilizers. So stabilizing the nitrogen with carbon. I will talk about this one. Organic amendments. You know this. You do this already with manure. Uh, maybe some of you composts, um, some of your manure potentially. Um, so making use of organic manures and um, organic amendments, compost, etc., to supply, of course, some of the organic forms of nitrogen, but also um, they bring lots of other benefits in terms of the carbon, the organic matter, the additional nutrients, the biology, etc. So organic amendments, yes, they also sit in the picture. Um, Biofertilizers could be an option, so a range of nitrogen-fixing um, organisms, uh, products, commercial products. There are DIY opportunities to make your own microbial type um, inoculants, um, many of which can then contain these nitrogen fixing bacteria. So uh, biofertilizers could be a good strategy here. Um, plant breeding, uh, I won't dwell on this one, but just to say that, of course, there's lots we can do with plant breeding for a whole range of different goals, specific goals, including nitrogen use efficiency. Just a small example, how about we breed plants that have bigger root systems. And those bigger root systems will catch on to more of that nitrogen, particularly the, the nitrate, and prevent it from leaching through. So that's one kind of breeding goal that could help to improve nitrogen retention um, and therefore improve nitrogen use efficiencies. Um, the inhibitors, of course, I won't talk about these either. You're all aware, the nitrification and urease inhibitors, that's a big discussion, um, but they can be a piece in this puzzle. Uh, precision fertilization, so of course using soil mapping and um, variable rate application. Yep, I, I think this is a great strategy too, has my approval. Uh, we can use other things like cover crops, catch crops or green manures, so using specific plants again to capture nitrogen to prevent those losses or in the case of a green manure, a legume-based green manure to maybe bring nitrogen into the system through nitrogen fixation, so they also play a role. Um, and then diverse pastures or multi-species pastures. I will say a few things on this um, relevant to uh, to the audience here today. And um, and lastly, okay, in a cropping context, it could also be companion or intercropping um, could also be um, a, a good strategy here. Okay, so I will say a few quick things on foliar. Um, 
if for those of you that don't, are not aware, I, earlier this year I did run a course on foliar nitrogen, an online course. It was a 10 lecture, very comprehensive lecture series on this exact topic. I'm not really going to go into it today, um, um, but I'm going to say a few key highlights. And if that is of interest to you, you will find more information of that on my website. It is now, everything was recorded. It is now available um, to purchase as an on-demand course. So um, if you like the little bits that you hear here now, um, there's a whole lot more detail um, that comes with it um, in that course. So firstly, on foliars, just to point out that yes, in nature, in natural ecosystems, plants do take up nutrients through their foliage. And we have many examples of this. Absolutely, ocean plants, uh, water-based plants, um, they are renowned for taking up nutrients through the foliage from particularly the ocean, uh, where all those nutrient minerals, rich minerals are. Uh, on top of this, we have some very interesting studies on looking at the benefits of dust and the plant's ability to actually acidify the leaf surface and strip soluble, particularly phosphorus, um, out of dust and um, take up that phosphorus. And they demonstrated this on chickpeas and um, wheat. Uh, so dust can also contribute. Uh, animal uh, insect feces. So um, we have a great study that shows that um, ant uh, feces um, is absorbed, uh, the, particularly in the organic form. Amino acids are absorbed uh, through the leaf. And then even fog. Uh, this was from a study from California, of course, on the redwoods that showed that um, ammonia gas, um, which uh, is found in fog, um, that the plants actually can indeed take that up through the foliage. So yes, foliar applying of nutrients is a very natural thing that happens out there in this beautiful planet of ours. So therefore, why? What's the opportunity here? Well, foliars, um, they can therefore achieve a higher nutri nutrient use efficiency and therefore improve the economics, the, better, the bottom line. And one of the key mechanisms by which they improve the nutrient use efficiencies is um, simply because it's the soil that's so re volatile and reactive. It's the soil where nitrogen is leached. It's the soil where nitrogen can be off-gassed as the ammonia or um, nitrous oxides. Um, nitrogen nitrates do not leach off the leaf, out of the leaf. Um, some nitrogen can be off-gassed off the leaf, but this happens at a fraction of the rate of as what it does down in the soil. So foliars have an advantage because they are preventing the losses. And of course, you're applying a lot less generally. You're using lower dose, more targeted applications directly onto the plant and trying to bypass the soil and some of those antagonisms and interactions and, and those potential losses. Um, so through foliage, you can also therefore improve uptake of that nitrogen that can help to drive yield, quality, metabolism of those plants. You can reduce those negative effects on the environmental losses as we talked about. Um, and also enhance the nutrient, the protein value of the food or feed um, and the benef health benefits that come with better protein, better true protein um, in the diet of be that animals or consumers. And so here's a, um, a slide just looking at these nutrient use efficiencies of soil applied nutrients. And you can see here that um, typically nitrogen is, um, we, we, generally rounded off at this kind of 50 odd percent, that generally about 50 odd percent of what we apply, of the nitrogen we apply, is taken up by the plants. Um, and the other 50% is potentially lost. That's not to say that all of it is lost. Some of that other 50% is turned into soil organic matter, held in the biology of the soil. Um, but yes, some of it can then also be lost into the ecosystem. So you can see here that the efficiency of a range of different nutrients is generally quite poor in soils. And it gets very bad when we hit the trace minerals. It's because they're required in such small quantities. And once we apply them to soil, all sorts of things can happen. Microbes can eat them. They can be fixed, uh, locked, up, <clears throat> locked up with other nutrients, fixed onto the soil particles. So generally, yes, I acknowledge that soils are the primary pathway in which plants are meant to take up nutrients. But I'm just acknowledging that there are all sorts of traps and um, difficulties in the soil associated with getting those nutrients um, into the soil, through the soil, and ultimately into the plant. Um, and you can see here that the efficiencies here generally are quite poor. And so this is the advantage through the, the foliar. However, I will acknowledge that the plant response 
depends on many variables. And this is where I, I just have to summarize and, and kind of move on for today's lecture. But if you're interested, I'll encourage you to, um, you'll find some other lectures on this uh, on YouTube. Um, you will find some free ones there, but if you really want the deep dive, it's you'll find it in the course. But um, so there are variable responses to foliar sprays. There's a lot to consider here. And I've kind of boiled it down into these four key categories. We have to really think about what the formulation is, what the spray mix is, how you apply it, what the plant is, what crop or what plant species it is, um, and what are the env uh, prevailing environmental conditions. You've got to understand all of the variables under these four categories and line as many of them up as possible in order to ensure you get a good response from that foliar spray. So a few quick examples. Formulation. Um, that means the form of nitrogen that you want to apply, like we talked about earlier, um, but it could also be the spray mix pH, generally more acidic is preferable. Um, you want it kind of to be maximum of six generally, um, is better for nutrient uptake. Um, the forms of nutrients, how soluble they are, what other nutrients go in there, spread of stickers, wetters, I mean, you name all of those other things that uh, water quality, another really big one. Um, all of those variables are important in terms of designing um, a good, successful foliar spray. Um, how you apply it, of course, your nozzles, is it not too fine, not too coarse, your forward speed, your coverage, your penetration into the canopy, the pressure, uh, and all of those kinds of things that you'll be aware of already. Um, different pl plant species. So I think in a pasture setting, this is among the top tier of the most ideal plants um, that respond to foliar sprays because you've got really high density of plants. It's not row crops with gaps in the middle and soil space. You know, you've got a really dense coverage of plant already and therefore leaf surface area already. So pastures are actually one of the ideal um, plant systems for um, use of foliar sprays. And there's, I, I'd encourage you, if any of you have not kind of following, there's some really good things that are coming out of Ireland and New Zealand and uh, UK um, on grassland specifically with farmers using these foliar strategies um, with success to really cut down as compared to their soil applied to cut down nitrogen fertilizer use. Um, and then lastly, environment. And this is just some common sense things like the time of the day, the temperature, not too hot, not too cold. But the big one here is the humidity. You've got to have good, as high humidity as possible. And the magic number here is about 70%. 70% or above is, is optimum. And that high humidity just helps the plant leaves be more open and more porous so that when you fold your apply, uh, you are able to, the plants are able to get those nutrients in. Okay, so then um, moving on, uh, Carbon-based inputs. Now, this is true if we're talking liquid foliars or even liquid for soil or dry-based fertilizers for soil. Um, the goal here is to always include a carbon source, a carbon stabilizer. And this picture summarizes this really nicely. Rather than apply the nutrient on its own, especially nitrogen, which is very reactive and leaky, as we talked about, Let's combine it with a carbon source. Carbon source is like a, a nice little chain here that has lots of charged surfaces. So it has a lot of exchange capacity. So it will bind to the nitrogen and wrap it up and stabilize it. We're changing the behavior of the small, simple inorganic ion. We are now changing the behavior by turning it into a larger, more complex molecule, like an organic form of nitrogen, organic molecule. Now that nitrogen is embedded within carbon, therefore it is more stable. It's also um, absorbed through the leaf more effectively, um, but in the soil, it's also less reactive to be lost, less leachable, less volatilizable, etc. So you wanna include a carbon source and surprise, surprise, urea again is already carbon-based. So again, it has a nice benefit there. And as we talked about earlier, from the efficiency of the metabolism of the plant, but that carbon can also help actually get that urea in um, to the uh, leaf of the plant. Um, and this is the key point. Um, I talked about urea being a good form, but when we apply it to the soil, it won't stay as urea. And this is the difference with the foliar urea, is that when we apply this carbon-based nitrogen onto the foliage, the plant will take up urea as urea. And this is the key how we get the benefit of that carbon-based 
um, organic nitrogen efficiency gain is that it has to go generally through the leaf because that's how you're going to get it in as urea. And that's kind of one of the key um, take homes that we labor a lot on in the course. So nonetheless, urea has some advantages. It is carbon based, but still we can improve that further. There's only one carbon atom there. You can see we can improve that further by wrapping it up in, in more carbon in order to stabilize that. And this is a really nice example. This is a study from Australia, an image, but it was from a study in Australia looking at a combining urea with um, like a brown coal with a humate um, compared to straight neat urea. And of course, we're looking at the thickness of the arrow here. You can see without the carbon-based stabilizer, we have a very thick uh, or large release of that urea down is therefore lost as leaching or lots of losses um, up into the atmosphere. Whereas the carbon-based urea, it's, it, it creates a slow release product. So we have a slow release. So we have less nitrogen being liberated, therefore slower rates of leaching, slower rates, less rates of volatilization, thereby leaving more um, available for the plant to make use of and for the plant to take up. So carbon-based fertilizers, they just help to stabilize the nitrogen, create kind of like a slow release product. From a granule dry point of view, this is kind of how you can do this. You could take a liquid carbon source, and I'm going to talk about these next, um, and coat a coat the fertilizer granule. So you could do this by just dribble, running the fertilizer granule up an auger or a conveyor and dribbling in a liquid um, to kind of run and rub all over those granules and kind of at least to provide a kind of a carbon coating around each and every granule. You could do that through um, other means um, within special vats or you know, concrete mixes or these types of things. But um, I think generally on the scale that we're talking about in Australia, something like um, an auger is, is typically the most commonly used technique to then dribble a liquid carbon onto those granules to create this stabilized um, nitrogen. So here's the types of carbon sources that you can use for this. Things like it could be as simple as molasses or sugar, um, but particularly humic and fulvic acids are very good. They have a very high, they're a big sponge. They have a very high exchange capacity to bind to that nitrogen. So humics and fulvics are very good. Um, amino acids can also be good. They have carbon-based nitrogen. So you're applying some organic nitrogen and some carbon to bind and stabilize your synthetic nitrogen. Uh, protein hydrolysates, things like a fish, for example, fish hydrolysate, seaweed, kelp extracts, plant extracts, compost extracts. All of these things have various carbon chains, carbon compounds in them that can bind to the nitrogen. Now, um, even if you're not doing a liquid coating here, even applying, and this comes back to integrated nitrogen management, even applying organic amendments, organic um, materials like compost, like manures, biochar, huma, again, humates, other agricultural byproducts, what are all these things contain? They contain carbon. So if you have applied carbon-based organic amendments to the soil, and then you are also applying a granular fertilizer, you have a carbon net there that can kind of catch onto that granule as it solubilizes, grab onto that nutrients and try and stabilize it on the carbon complex that um, comes from a compost or a manure, for example. I can see I'm getting a little tight on time. I'm going to have to scoot through the end of my presentation here. We're almost close to the end. Um, just lastly, then to move on and say, of course, you have lots of free stuff in the air. If, if nitrogen um, in the gaseous form in the air as nitrogen gas, 78% of our air is made up of nitrogen. So you do have a good opportunity to encourage natural nitrogen fixation and get some of the free stuff. This also, of course, has to be part of an integrated strategy. It's not just about what we apply. It's also about trying to optimize the free stuff that what we can get. And as you're all aware, I did, I alluded to this earlier, so I won't dwell, but yes, we have legumes who um, form nodule based um, fixation, um, symbiotic fixation with those rhizobia. But we also have these other groups of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So some of these others are called associative. And these are the ones that, that live on any other plant species, again, grasses, broadleafs, you name it, anything, um, that just really live in the rhizosphere, live on the root system, um, uh, or maybe a little bit in the root system. Um, endophytes would also um, fit under this category, uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live inside the plant. So these plants, they associate with the plant. 
sorry, these microbes, they associate with the plant and they fix nitrogen for the plant, not in a nodule. So they're not as efficient and effective as the nodule, but nonetheless, they can still make a contribution. And then we also have free living nitrogen fixes. And these are the bacteria that don't even need to be associated to it with a plant. They actually can just fix nitrogen into their environment, um, even without the help or any um, mutualism uh, with a plant whatsoever. Um, I won't dwell on this one just because of time. I just wanted to acknowledge this was a really interesting study out of the US looking at maize, where they found a, um, a variety or a land race uh, mixed genetics population of maize from um, grown from Mexico amongst the indigenous population there, um, which had these unusual roots that were producing this huge amount of mucilage, these root exudates, and they isolated nitro fixing bacteria in here which were growing kind of like a nodule. That thick mucilage was protecting the bacteria inside, creating anaerobic conditions where that bacteria was then fixing nitrogen into this maize. Now, of course, this maize was not as high um, producing, high yielding as um, some of our varieties, for example. But nonetheless, in terms of its nitrogen requirement, in terms of the ability of the bacteria to supply the nitrogen requirement to, this uh, to the maize, um, they found that it could contribute anywhere from around about 30 to 80% of the nitrogen demands or nitrogen requirements of that maize um, just from the bacteria. Now, that's a very wide range. And the reason is this is not a variety. It's a land race. So the, the genetics of the maize population is highly variable. It's not a one specific variety. So, of course, there's a, a broader range of the ability. Let's take the smallest number there, 30%. Imagine if all of our maize varieties, and I'm using maize as an example here, this, this can be done in um, grasses, in wheat, in other plants, and there is this type of work happening. But just as an example, even if we said that we could supply 30% of maize's nutrient requirements or some of your pasture um, amongst the grasses, uh, nitrogen requirements through this associative fixation, even that number alone would be a fantastic goal, a fantastic achievement. Um, so clearly the potential is there. And, and of course, now these researchers are doing work at crossing these genes over into modern varieties. So we follow this with interest to see how that goes. But um, and then just to point out that when we talk about nitrogen fixation, I bring it back to our metabolic pathway here. Nitrogen, it enters at this point here. Um, the nitrogen gas is converted into ammonia, which rapidly becomes ammonium in the plant. And we need certain nutrients for this too. Molybdenum is the big one. Molybdenum and iron are the big ones. Nickel also, again, plays a role in nitrogen fixation. And phosphorus is especially important. Phosphorus is really important for supplying energy ATP um, to the um, to the bacteria. So that's for the basic uh, end fixation. If we expand that to specifically include legumes on top of those um, key four nutrients, um, we also need calcium, boron, copper and cobalt and copper for um, for legumes. Um, so these are the nutrients are really important. And what I'm pointing out here is is that if you have a deficiency, an imbalance, or a limitation of the, any of these nutrients, this could actually be constraining or undermining the ability um, of those bacteria to fix nitrogen. So again, nitrogen fixation, as you know, it's not just about putting the organism out there. You know, you've got to line up the right strain to the right variety of plants, as we know we understand that kind of concept, but also you've got to think about the nutrient requirements for the bacteria not just for the plant, but for the bacteria. They are the ones that need these nutrients in order to fix that nitrogen. So again, being a bit holistic with your nutrient management, it's also about some of these other nutrients here. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, just for brevity of time, I'm gonna push on all I was, everyone criticizes nitrogen fixation that it's such an energy ex extensive and intensive process. I was gonna read you this great quote that just points out that Yes, it is an energy intensive process for the plant. Uh, the plant has to provide 12 grams of glucose, of sugar, of energy um, to get one gram of nitrogen um, back from the microbe. Um, however, this process is still less energy and energetically expensive than the Harbor Bosch process. 
um, which to produce the same amount of nitrogen requires a temperature of four to 500 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 200, 250 bars. I'm just pointing out that, yes, I know end fixation is expensive for the plant. It has to give away photosynthetic carbon to get that nitrogen. Um, and therefore, um, I, I, yes, we agree, but just pointing out that in order to generate these kind of temperatures and pressure that we do in, uh, as humans in our industrial process of the Harper-Bosch process, that takes a whole lot of energy as well. So I think we need to be honest about the energy intensiveness on both sides of that discussion. Um, okay, let's round it off with a quick chat on um, diversity in pastures. So here, um, this is uh, a study, um, I apologize, out of Ireland, but um, so you can take it with a grain of salt if you want, but it, it still illustrates a really nice principle. Um, here, we're looking at comparing um, a monoculture of perennial ryegrass versus some mixed um, pastures. Uh, mix one here was um, perennial ryegrass with Timothy, and red clover, white clover. And then in mix two, again, we had the same um, grasses and legumes, but we also added plantain and um, chicory, a little bit more diversity in mix two. And we are comparing monocultures versus a little bit mi basic mixtures um, across a nitrogen fertilizer gradient. So as you can see here in the monoculture at zero kgs of nitrogen under monocultures, this is the biomass production that we achieve. And um, you can see that at zero, simply by having a little bit of two legumes, a bit of diversity here, two legumes there, we far exceeded the biomass production still at zero kgs in both of these treatments. So let's go up to 120 kgs. Okay, as soon as we add fertilizer, yes, we increase production of our ryegrass, of our monoculture ryegrass up into this point here, just below um, 10 tons there. Okay, if we come across here, well, oh, actually, just with those legumes, still at zero kgs, we have still out yielded um, 120 kgs of a monoculture. Uh, we have still out yielded in our two mixes, um, even at zero. Okay, so let's go up now to 240 kgs of nitrogen on that mono ryegrass. Now we come up to our biomass production here. At this point, we can see that, okay, there is a slight yield advantage here on mix one. And if we come over here, we can see it's on par. So here we're pointing out that at zero kgs of nitrogen, just in a slightly more diverse pasture that includes some legumes and a few other herbs, um, broadleafs, that at zero kgs with just a bit of extra plant species diversity, we can match the yield as 240 kgs of nitrogen applied to a monoculture perennial ryegrass. So the plant species diversity, legume-based pastures, of course, um, makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I'll quickly cut to this point. This was a study looking also at diversity on pastures. So here we're comparing single species with some multi-species swords, uh, composing of three, four, six, and eight plant species. And again, we had a nitrogen gradient here of either zero nitrogen versus 150 kgs of nitrogen. So it's in zero, 150 across a monoculture versus then also some diverse plots. I'll read you this quote here. Manipulating species richness and functional group or the plant species diversity had a positive effect on the dry matter yield and produced better quality of the forage when compared with a single species sward. Crude protein in the forage of the diverse swards of the grass legs you mixtures was also greater than that for the grass monoculture. Uh, then in terms of the effect of the nitrogen, zero versus 150, the nitrogen application had a positive effect on the single species sward, on the monocultural sward yield, but it decreased the yield of the multi-species sward because that nitrogen, of course, can have suppressive effects on the legumes, maybe some of those other herbs and things that were included, and actually overall then decrease the biomass production. So here we show that nitrogen had a suppressive effect. Um, this one, uh, very quickly, I'm just going to read the, the points on the right-hand side. Um, when you, If you watch the replay, you can um, read the full abstracts here uh, and press pause, of course. But we're just looking at a grass legume mixture compared to um, a mono grass. And I'll just read you the highlights of this study also. Uh, we describe how the legume proportion mixed in with those grasses modifies the nitrogen acquisition from different sources. 
uh, how the, the plants are obtaining nitrogen from the soil. Symbiotic nitrogen fixation was stimulated in the mixtures compared to the monocultures. Obviously, we have some legumes there. We're going to get more nitrogen fixation. But what they also showed is that having a grass and a legume, um, that actually having the grass there stimulates the legume to fix more nitrogen as compared to a monoculture of legume. And that's for the simple reason that a grass is a nitrogen hungry species. And so when we match a grass and a legume together, that grass is constantly absorbing, stealing nitrogen, taking nitrogen from the soil, and that forces the legume to keep on fixing nitrogen. So nitrogen, so legumes will fix more nitrogen per plant in a mixture than they will in a monoculture. And that's because of this kind of stealing and sharing effect of the nitrogen. Uh, uptake of the nitrogen from the soil nitrogen pools was stimulated in mixtures compared to monocultures. So there was greater nitrogen uptake from the soil, therefore leaving less leaky nitrogen lying around. And then the acquired nitrogen, the nitrogen that was obtained from the soil, was used more efficiently by the mixtures for biomass production. So the mixtures produced more biomass per unit of nitrogen than the monocultures did. Okay, so there's a lot of potential opportunities here um, with more diverse pastures. I hope you're all doing some diverse pastures there already. Okay, in closing, I apologize, I've gone a little over, but we've still got a good 20 minutes for some chat. Um, nitrogen, it's very leaky, very reactive. There is a, both an economic for you and an environmental imperative to improve our nitrogen use efficiencies and reduce those losses. It's good for the environment. It's good for your back pocket. Plants, they can make use of many different forms of nitrogen, and it is those organic forms that are more efficient that we should also be paying attention to. Nitrogen is not an island. You've got to manage those other synergistic nutrients like the iron, the sulfur, the molybdenum, the manganese, etc. And maybe you can use a plant analysis or a sap analysis to monitor these. And you want to integrate many of those strategies overall to manage nitrogen. Yes, maybe foliars could be a part of that also the carbon-based stabilizers, also diverse pastures. Bring all of these tools um, together um, and create an integrated system that um, helps to maximize the free stuff, but also minimize all of the losses, et cetera. So, okay, well, thank you very much. Let's um, open the floor for some discussion. Joel, wow, that was fascinating. and. Um took me back many, many years to my biochemistry classes at university. <laughs> so, um, and at the time I didn't see the relevance of all of it, but uh, you know, now it's pretty obvious <laughs> why it was important. Well, you've stimulated a whole lot of questions, um, which is great. So I'll start yeah. at the top um, and move down. Um, from Andrew um, Weinhardt, uh, are, na are nitrogen, nitrogen fixing bacteria aerobic or anaerobic? Ooh, great question. Um, they are aerobic organisms, but they require anaerobic conditions to fix nitrogen. And that's um, why um, legumes build the nodules, ultimately to create a little anaerobic environment. So they push no oxygen out of the nodules and um, reduce the oxygen. And the reason for this is that the main reason is that it's all to do with, I mentioned it briefly, I didn't labor on it, but I mentioned that nitrogenase enzyme. That's the special enzyme that bacteria produce that has the ability to grab onto atmospheric nitrogen and um, enzymatically catalyze its conversion to that ammonia. Um, it is that enzyme specifically that is very sensitive to oxygen. That's the main reason. It's the ends. It's not so much the concern of the organism itself. It's that enzyme does not function in high oxygen conditions, and so that's why the, the legumes build a nodule to get rid of the oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, and Andrew also asked, and I was going to mention. I should have said to Joel that we have uh, Mediterranean climate down here, and ninety percent of um, of uh, grazing systems here are annual. We are trying to encourage more perenniality and mixtures into the system, but it's challenging, obviously, because we have a long, very long dry season. Um, yes. Uh, some some growers have grasses like kikuyu um, in, in the pasture, but I'm just wondering if you have any comments in relating to um, those annual systems. I mean, I know you did mention um, 
the rules on nitrogen for annual cropping, would they also apply then in an annual pasture scenario? Um, and what would happen when we're trying to transition in that case? Mm. Yeah, there, I would say some of the rules then on um, annual cropping um, do are more relevant or do apply even more so um, to an annual pasture-based system as well. So yeah, very much so. Um, but I would also agree, I, I would encourage you where possible to try and think about perenniality. I know you have a long, hot, dry summer and that becomes um, also very difficult, but um, um, I'm sure there must be some native grasses there that can, I know they're going to probably go dormant in the summer, but at least they'll be established and then to, to kind of re, um, when dormancy breaks, to kind of come back into production come the autumn time. But but yeah, you're right. I, I, I probably, I would guess then that, your annual based pasture systems would behave a little more like um, an annual cropping situ um, situation in that example that I gave. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and Sandra, yes, we are sending out a recording of the presentation. Um, Grant Hamilton asks Would leaf tests be a better option compared to soil test to determine what nutrients to add to the foliar? And how often would they need to be done in a grazing system? Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, a leaf, a plant analysis, be that leaf or a sap analysis, is definitely a preferred tool um, to then design a foliar program for. I think, as a general notion, soil um, analysis is best to determine soil inputs, and plant analysis is best to determine foliar inputs. There's definitely uh, exceptions to the rule there, but that's, I think, a good general um, idea. Um, so yes, I think uh, leaf analysis is very important. It's it's quick turn, reasonably quick turnaround. You can be reactive and adaptive and respond to that, and that's one of the other benefits of the foliar approach is that you get the nutrients into the plant quickly. Um, if you apply it to the soil, it takes time for them to break down, to solubilize, to get into the soil, to then be taken up, and that's the beauty of the foliar approach. If you have a leaf analysis and you have a deficiency of something, by far the quickest way to address that is through a foliar. Um, once you apply that foliar, those nutrients, the bulk of those nutrients really are absorbed within the first six or so hours um, is really the bulk of your nutrient uptake. You know, And within kind of 24 hours, pretty much um, most of the job is done. So, um, so yes, that's the best. And then in terms of the frequency, yeah, that's a good question. It really is going to depend a bit on the intensity of your system. You know, under intensive dairy guys, they might be doing, um, uh, you know, as frequently as a, as a monthly type analysis. Um, but I think for a, a beef um, context, I would probably um, be thinking more like um, something like two per growing season, you know, two, maybe three, um, but kind of two analyses. And, and I, the timing of that, you could really debate and discuss this. I think there's kind of nuance to this, but I guess as a, as a general idea, I would try and think of it as the timing of at least one of the applications should be kind of in those earlier vegetative type stages when you're trying to, you know, come out of um, establish and get the plant up and going. You definitely want to um, kind of do that. The other way to thinking about it in a, generally in a cropping kind of context is that then maybe you'd want another one later to help it move onwards into the reproductive stage and i know that you're not necessarily always going to in a grazing setting you're not going to want it to let it go to seed and go to reproduction so you might not want to do that that next one but maybe really you could time that after a, um, a grazing event um, and then get it and wait for a little bit of leaf recovery um, and then maybe take an analysis for to then do a spray for kind of the next phase of of a grazing cycle kind of thing. I would kind of try and time it to your grazing cycles. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, I mean, everyone's probably familiar with leaf testing, but not so many people familiar with SAP analysis. Um, it's not done here very commonly and um, for our audience's benefit, um, local agroecologist Mark Tupman actually does SAP, test, SAP analysis tests for people mm -hmm. if they want to touch base with him. I can give, him, give you his details. Um, uh, speaking of Mark, he has a question here. Um, can you highlight some of the plant health growth issues associated with excess soil nitrate? Sure. Yeah, I, I, look, I go into this in depth in the online course because I think it is a little more relevant in a cropping context. I think it has a lot of relevance there. Um, maybe not so much in a grazing, but again, if you guys are a bit more yeah, annual-based, 
then maybe. And um, the point here is, is that, so on the nitrate, it mm -hmm. is, um, it's really that imbalance that you can see that that excess of nitrate there um, is basically as that starts to accumulate, there's a couple of things here, but you're creating imbalances with the other nutrients. And therefore um, that can influence the, if the plants then are draining the use of those other nutrients to try and push that nitrate through, the plants are not using those nutrients elsewhere for other growth processes. So that's a part of it. The other part of it is that nitrates are particularly attractive to sap sucking insects. So they can be more of an attractant for aphids. If some of the plants then have an uh, aphid, if your pastures have an aphid issue, it can be more attractive, particularly to sap suckers. And lastly, then the point is that um, in order to grow a healthy plant, you want all of the nitrogen in that protein uh, organic form. That's the functional form. Having nitrates, they do serve a function in the plants in terms of ionic balance, keeping kind of um, electro neutrality, so balancing the charge between positive and negative nutrients. So they do serve a function in that sense. But in a way, the nitrate, there's a kind of the phrase here that says it's not, it's a, it's not a functional form. It's not really as usable for the plant. It's the building block. It's it's the amino acids and then the the proteins that have a lot more functionality. So you can have plants, this will sound a bit silly, but you can have plants, for example, that are very high in nitrates, could also be true of urea, very high in urea. And that, and there's a really good study that demonstrates this on urea, where the plants had very, very high urea in the leaf, but they were vis visually, physically demonstrating symptoms of nitrogen deficiency. And that's because the nitrogen was there, but in the wrong form. So the plants therefore didn't have amino acids, didn't have proteins, and therefore were demonstrating nitrogen visual deficiency symptoms. So it's functional nitrogen is the answer. Nitrate is not a functional form. You really want those organic forms. They are the ones that can do lots of things in the plant. They're the real machinery of the plant, the biological machinery. That's the kind of the forms that you um, particularly want. And just quickly, in the cropping context, generally more it's you want good, you don't want all those building blocks back there. You want to push it into the high nitrate form, uh, sorry, the high protein forms. The reason there is, is that um, the insects, particularly this is true of insects and to a, to a lesser extent, but also with disease, that um, these become unfavorable forms in the complete and complex proteins for those. So just to give you an example, one step back from that was those amino acids. All life forms compete for amino acids. We like amino acids, insects do, disease do, plants do, animals do. Every, building blocks are the, amino acids are the building blocks of, of all living things. Um, it's then what we do with these amino acids, which is then very different. Humans go and turn all those hu amino acids into human proteins. Uh, insects go and turn those amino acids, it's insect things that insects need and plants, you do it into plant ones and et cetera, et cetera. And so everyone competes for amino acids. And so if you don't have optimized nutrient uh, in terms of that pathway, and you therefore you don't have optimized protein production, you can have accumulation of free amino acids, similar to nitrates. This becomes more attractive to some of our insect pests and, and disease. So it's that kind of imbalances that ultimately make the plant more attractive to um, pests and disease is the overall answer. Yeah, and um, um, here we have seasonally always issues with um, red-legged earth mite, and this year in particular was seems to be bad in a lot of places. So, uh, uh, is a similar mm. reason? Yes, yes, for sure. There's a bit, there is a link there with nitrates, particularly mm. on uh, red-legged. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and sorry, Grant, I missed an earlier question from you. Um, can you explain how the priming effect of foliar sprays work to kickstart biology? Does it still work in a pasture system? Yes, definitely. Um, the mechanism here is really simple. When you deliver those nutrients through the foliage um, into the leaf, those nutrients, so some of those nutrients very directly, some more indirectly, but those nutrients are used for photosynthesis, to prime photosynthesis. So particularly things like um, iron, magnesium, uh, nitrogen, manganese, uh, phosphorus, um, these directly drive photosynthesis. And so when you are boosting photosynthesis, you are boosting sugar production. Some of those sugars 
and it's around about um, you know 30 odd percent that goes down to the roots and excreted out of the roots it kind of hovers anywhere from 20 it can be anywhere really it can be lower it could even be up to as much as 50 odd percent but let's use the general quoted figure of 30 percent about 30 percent of those photosynthetic sugars are exuded straight out of the root system to feed biology and that's the exact mechanism if you do not have adequate nutrients you're not going to be able to maximize that photosynthetic sugar production and therefore you'll be sending less sugars down to the roots exuding less sugars out of the root system and therefore lower stimulation of the soil biology so that's the that's the mechanism there mm, okay um brett asks uh will dissolved urea with liquid humate molasses seaweed mixed in a spray tank tank be the best way to get nitrogen onto a multi-species pasture mix mm. and what rate of urea and urea and carbon sources would you use it's quite mm. detailed mm. <laughs> good question I'll say this, um, there is a bit of concern around, um, and I gave a great example of this, again, nitrogen having suppressive effects on multi-species pastures. And those studies that I shared with you there earlier, that was soil-based applications. And, um, and again, I think that this is one of the advantages of the foliar in, in which that it keeps nitrogen out of the soil and therefore has less of these suppressive effects. But I will say this from experience over in Europe, What's um, the guys who are doing the foliar nitrogen strategy and uh, multi-species pastures are finding is that they typically will use a foliar nitrogen generally early on in the beginning of the growing season just to help with that kind of establishment or, okay, for them because they're perennial, um, they find it also helps just to get break dormancy uh, a bit better. So I would say an early foliar application onto a multi-species pasture totally has my vote i think this is a good idea so this would be good for you for that early establishment phase but it may not be something that i would do as intensely as um uh, in maybe some other context just because it may start to have some of those um suppressive effects that i outlined before but but again through the foliar we're trying to minimize those anyway so i think i'd be i'd yeah i'd be i'd be keen to hear your feedback on what you find if you were to do that but i think Coming back to the point, the early one is definitely valid and um, useful. Now, in terms of the rate, um, the general application rate that I recommend for foliar ear is a really good starting point. And don't get me wrong, I know people, they go lower than what I say. Some people go a lot higher than what I say. But I think a generally good application rate is around about 20 to 30 kilos of actual urea. So that's, you know, half of that is units of nitrogen if it's about 50%. So around about 20 to 30 kilos of actual urea per hectare. Um, now with that, um, I would apply, as you mentioned, yeah, a mixture of carbon sources, a bit of molasses and humic or seaweed. All of those sound good. I would apply maybe even a combination of two or three of those. And the exact rates, I, I you would have to just check because some seaweeds are very alkaline and some acidic. So it's going to be depending, same with humix. They have very different application rates depending on how they're extracted and ma made. So it's not huge amounts. Just to give you a ballpark, it, you know, you could do a couple of liters, two to five liters of molasses of the seaweed and humic. It's going to be something like only a couple of liters, one or two liters of each, something like that. Um, per hectare but just double check the label rates because different products are differently made and extracted etc so but just to give you an idea 20 to 30 kgs of urea and then that kind of couple of liters or so of the carbon um, sources and then as i mentioned a bit of acidification a little bit of citric acid in there for example just to bring the spray ph down maybe your waters are already out um, uh, already a bit more acidic but if you have slightly more alkaline water which I think you guys do. You've got some um, limestone kind of areas there, don't you, I think? Um, so just to check your water pH, but if it is on the alkaline side, you definitely want to add a little bit of acidifier just to bring that down to around about six or so. Yep. Uh, and I know Brett, who asked this question, he's, um, he's, he's got dry land, but he's also got irrigated pastures he's been putting multi-species into. Um, okay. So he's got extending his growing season quite significantly by doing that. Um, I just might a question regarding um, humates or fulvic versus humic acids. Um, I heard read that fulvic was better for foliar and humics was better for soil. Is that right? Or? 
Yeah, that's that's my view on this. And again, there's different views to different people um, have different views to this. But my view is that yes, because fulvic acid is a smaller molecule, and so that smaller molecule means that it passes through the leaf more effectively, um, and certainly more faster. It's not to say that humic is ineffective as a foliar. I, I know people use humic and urea together as a foliar, and look, it does work well. And if it's working for you, great. It has my support. Uh, I think absolutely fine. But just as a as a general idea, the fulvic is smaller, therefore it does pass through more effectively and quicker. And I think speed of uptake is an important consideration for the success of a foliar spray. The longer the foliar spray is sitting around on the leaf, the more prone it is to maybe being washed off or volatilizing off or some of those losses. You want to get it into the leaf as quickly as possible. And that's where I think fulvic is preferable than humic. But honestly, you can use either. They are okay. And fulvic is just a bit more versatile. You can mix it with other things. It's a bit less fussy about what you can mix it with. So, so yes, I lean towards fulvic, but fine. I accept that humic um, is also okay. Um, well, we're very close to time, but there are a couple of questions I want to make sure get asked, so I will. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on plant uptake of amino sugars and related benefits? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, not a deep comment on this. So amino sugars are um, components of uh, a lot of the microorganisms in the soil, their cell walls and, and these kinds of things. Um, and yeah, you're right. Look, um, plants do take those up and um, uh, they, as, we, I, as I did mention, they engulf the bacteria through the rhizo, uh, rhizophagy cycle, but also as microorganisms die and decay, some of these amino sugars are also released um, as the microorganism is decaying and breaking down. And yes, the plant can make use of these. No, I don't have deep co a comment about that apart from saying that um, they are organic. Again, they are carbon-based forms, so they are more organic-based forms, so they will have that e efficiency edge. Joe Wren. Um, they, will have, they will have they will have efficiency edge. So yeah, I, I think they're it's a good good strategy, and yes, I think they have the efficient more they more behave more like those organic uh, forms that I talked about in terms of being carbon-based and therefore more energy efficient for the plant to use. Um, just a final couple of questions um, uh, from, our, from a viticulturist we have in our area. Um, he has asked, uh, Earl has asked, do you have any recommendations for grape vines that grow in a summer, a dry summer regime in the absence of irrigation? And secondly, can one combine foliar with sulfur? Does it enhance burn? Yeah, good question. Um, look, yeah, there's actually been, um, a lot of work looking at foliar urea on grapevines. Um, there's actually a lot of work on there. If, um, if you want to send me, you'll find my website easily. You know, so if you want to send me an email, I can send you a link to a really good paper on this. Um, yeah, because um, I'm just trying to remember what the optimum timing was for this. Um, I'm sure it was around, around about right on Verizon. I'd have to just double check this, um, but I'm sure it was right on Verizon that was um, particularly a good time. But, but yes, look, I would say that um, foliars are good on grapes too, um, urea also particularly, but foliars generally. And I think that in a dry situation, in a non-irrigated context, actually this is an example where foliars are also highly advantageous because um, as the soil dries out, of course, the soil is where the plant gets the nutrients from. And as the soil dries out, it becomes more difficult for the plant to extract those nutrients from the drying soil and so you can bypass this issue by delivering them directly through the leaf so this there's been a lot of studies that have shown that um, foliars can help plants in dry can in drought conditions and it can help them hold on for longer um, under these drought stress so so yes um, it is used commonly on grapes you just have to be careful of some of the carbon-based additives because of your flavor well, are we talking, yeah, you must be talking wine grapes. So, um, obviously, yes. there's concerns around, yeah, it would be, yeah, so fish, um, any of those kind of taint, um, things that might taint the wine. So you have to be a bit careful about some of your carbon-based biostimulants, so like things like fish, um, seaweeds. But I think your humics and fulvics, they they wouldn't really have any issue in terms of flavor like that. So, um, but yes, yeah, so yes. And then, um, yeah, the sulfur question. Yeah, um, 
you know, wettable sulfur. Yeah, it's yeah. To be honest, no, I don't think I would see any issues with including sulfur and putting some other nutrient mixes in there. I don't, I don't think there's an issue with that at all. Yeah. I would okay, that. I think that's all we've got time for. We're pretty much at the end anyway. <laughs> that was just brilliant, uh, Joel. Really, really fantastic. And I think nitrogen is such an essential tool in the toolbox. But as we've heard from you, can be so much more effective depending on how it works in the soil system. So uh, as Joel mentioned, if you want to dig deeper, um, he has got his 10 lecture um, online course series and resources package available on his website, which the website address is integratedsoils.com. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, so head there um, and you can um, book in for that deeper, deeper dive. Um, it's getting pretty late now, so <laughs> I will <laughs> We're actually going to be recording a podcast after this as well. So poor Joel is in for it. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So you're good. If you need to wrap up with a few comments, that's fine. Take your time. That's okay. Um, for our audience, um, before you sign out, can I just ask you to complete our webinar evaluation form? It just takes a couple of minutes and it's super helpful for us um, in making sure we're providing the right content for you. Uh, and lastly, you may or may not know that we've recently publicly launched our own online community and information hub called Talking After Hours, um, which we created to give our community the opportunity to have conversations and share knowledge and skills and practices in a no judgment and easy access space at any time and anywhere. Um, so this is where we have a knowledge hub, knowledge bank within it, and I will put the recording of this um, webinar up there along with Joel's PDF, in addition to, to sending it out to you. But if you haven't joined Talking After Hours, then please head to our website. It's free um, to join, uh, and we'd really welcome your input. So um, <clears throat> that's it for me, I think. Um, thanks once again to Soilwise for the support, uh, to Joel, and to also you, the audience, for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks and goodbye.